is Larry, and I'm an author and illustrator. And a lot of times I have a lot of kids in the audience, and I'll ask. I'm going to kind of play around this, with this presentation because I, there's no kids here, so it, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> so, so I'll say, what does an author do? And they'll be like, they write. You know, they do. So I, of course, I agree. yes, they, they are writers. So I have this little example, just a few words. Watch out, a mask. And they're all like, everybody's looking around. And a, a, a writer could write that. So let's talk about an illustrator. What does an illustrator do? They draw the pictures. Yay. Yes, they draw the pictures. An illustrator creates an image that will accompany the author's accompany the author's words, so the reader has a visual aid to help imagine the mask we have to watch out for, like this guy. And all the kids are like, oh my god. And I said, what if can you imagine that mask coming in? We're just like, say, watch out for a mask. He's got a little club, he's got little skinny legs, and you don't even know what eyes he's looking out of it right here, you know, this crazy looking mask. So an illustrator using pictures can continue to tell a story after we've read those just few words, watch out a mask. For instance, if we were this little circle guy right here, obviously this little mask guy is trying to poke us. Without any words, we can see that. Without any words, we can see that this little circle, if it was one of us, we did get poked. And then without any words, we can see that something after the stick is being drawn here, that our eyes get glassy, and we start to develop this little weird bruise on our body, and things are happening, and through pictures we can see that he's starting to morph into something. He's looking down at his once little circle body, and boom, he's become a mask. So this was, this was a sequence of drawings I did for um, a development in a video game. So video game companies have called me sometimes just seeing my books to ask me to create um, sequences of drawings or concept drawings. So it's been a really fun career with a million things that have happened other than just making books. For instance, I've, I've traveled all over, I should have all scribbly lines here, where I've been in the United States, from the East Coast to the West Coast through Canada, um, talking about my books and illustration and writing. And one of the most amazing trips that happened uh, last year was this big red line, a trip all the way over to Southeast Asia to a place that looks like this. And this, this was amazing. There's mosques and temples all over the place, big golden ones, and ones on river systems and these lakes. Ancient, I mean, super old. It's like land, uh, time stood still over here. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. So these, they have these big, giant, long boats with these really cool motors, a big diesel motor, and the engine has a big, long shaft that sticks out with a big propeller, and they fly down these little riverways. Here's one of the boats right there, so that's, that's what I kind of cruised around on. And I checked out this big uh, village that was built on top of the water, all with bamboo sticks. And you can see these are all the carpenters over there. They, just like we see guys you know, on, on framework with skill saws and everything else, all they had was little things to tie things up and to cut little bamboo. And all those houses were built like this. So everything was on stilts. You can see the families just at work. Here's a dad, here's a grandmother, a little son. Even the pigs, chickens, babies, everything were just on top of the water. The gardens. So it was, even my hotel was on top of the water. That's where I stayed. So I took elephant rides through the jungle, and I found little great markets that actually sold stuff like um, real monkey skulls. They had shards off of old uh, mosques that were just broken up pieces that were amazing if you want to put it on your like mantelpiece or something. These things could be in art museums, but they just they don't have any of that over there. So they just sell this stuff. But I've also met like you know, these, uh, they call them long necks. And I hugged these ladies, I thought they were amazing. And then I finally ended up at the school where I taught some art, talked to these kids from kindergarten all the way through high school level. And this is the school, they had a little soccer field right in front of it. And it was the International School of Yangon in Burma, in oh. Southeast Asia. Yep. And now Myanmar is all of So they had posters out like this. We love your books, Timmy. So it's so cool to see my books known all the way on the other side of the world. And for those not familiar, um, here I'll show you a few of the books right here. Uh, the Story of Frog Belly Ratbone, I wrote and illustrated. 
And that has been out for over 10 years now, and it became a play in Los Angeles. Um, all kinds of great things have happened in that book. Next, Out for Adventure is another one that I wrote and illustrated. And this is a brand new release, uh, April 8th it came out, called The Almost Fearless Hamilton Squidlegger. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. So, uh, other books, A Diary of Victor Frankenstein. And by the way, this one was an amazing adventure in itself. It was the first book that I ever illustrated. And I did it on a sailing trip with my father from Florida all the way to Guatemala, alone on a 30-foot boat. And it was five months. It, it was amazing. I had to use enthusiasm to talk these art directors into letting me go on this trip because they kind of just clashed and, I, and they and asked me to do this book a year ahead. And we were waiting for Stephen King was the one that we were waiting to write it. But he fell, actually fell through. He couldn't do it. He was just too busy. They had another writer to do it. And by the time the book was ready to go, my dad was ready to take his trip. And so I said, you've got to let me do this book. And they let me. They flew me back from Guatemala, Belize, to hand in drawings. They called me York. Do you need anything else from him before we send him back to the jungle? Sent me back down to Belize. I'd get on a chicken bus and try to find my dad wherever he was, that had taken the boat since you know that, that week that I was away. And went through little villages and, and went up rivers with with uh, Mayan Indians and dug out canoes and howling monkeys. And, and so this book came out in 1997 and it all came together. It was just that story, and I could talk for hours on that adventure. And illustration is kind of like acting because I had to act like the doctor on this and, and fill in his sketchbook with this, reading this manuscript, you know, his, his experimentations with little uh, electrodes trying to um, hook into like little frog legs, severed frog legs to make them leap off the table and animate, you know, dead flesh and all this kind of stuff. So I was kind of the doctor. And then here I'm playing this kid trying to make this big old dog happy. So illustration is kind of like, like acting. You read the manuscript and you have to play the part. So other books are Don't Let the Peas Touch by Deborah Blumenthal, Mr. and Mrs. God in the Creation Kitchen by Nancy Wood, Snook Alone, great story of your a dog person. He's got a best buddy, a monk. They live on uh, this faraway island. They, a storm separates them. He's by himself for a while. It's his little adventure, and it's a super happy ending. Awesome book. And Finn Throws a Fit by David Elliott, about this little guy right here, who you can't imagine throwing a fit, but he does. He throws one huge. Lightning in the kitchen. The house floods when he cries. It's a funny, funny little book. And uh, recently, this one came out. I illustrated this book called Wild Boy by Mary Lazure. She went over to France and studied the, the real case of the feral child that they found back in 1795. Uh, they saw him digging up potatoes alongside these farms, and eventually they captured him. He was about eight or nine years old. No parents, no clothes, no shoes. He'd been living in the wilderness by himself. No language, nothing. They could not find out his backstory, anything. And then, I don't know if you've heard of this one, but The Tale of Despero uh, uh, by Kate D. Camillo. I was able to illustrate this, and so grateful to have that opportunity to illustrate this. It won the Newbery Medal, and it's about a little princess that falls in love with a little tiny mouse, and a mouse falls in love with a princess. It's a topsy-turvy, awesome fairy tale story that the world fell in love with. It's published in almost every language you can imagine, Japanese, complex Chinese, Hungarian. Look at all these incredible covers in different countries and languages all over the world. Czechoslovakian, German. So um, because the world fell in love with it, it was so popular, uh, there was a little secret out there. Something was going to happen that was big. And I was able to go in to illustrate the book, you know, to revisit the illustrations that were black and white pencil drawings and um, develop them into color illustrations. So the whole book became a special edition color. And this little mouse that loved the light so much, this little hero, became a movie mouse. So it was amazing to see this book we worked so hard on become a movie and go to the movies and actually see these characters. Just like the frog leg rap on becoming a play, it was just amazing. So my, my process 
uh, of making art. I, I love to paint fast and make mistakes. A lot of kids don't like to make mistakes and they feel like their drawing is ruined if they go out of the line or whatever. And I just enjoy that. And, and once you fix a mistake, you've made another layer. And layer after layer makes a painting or a drawing even that much more interesting. And I like to expect change and welcome change, to just watch the drawing and pain develop. And I, uh, I put a couple examples of, of how some of these, I, I work on wood, I work on paper, I work on canvas. And this is kind of how loose I'll start something. This is going to just be like a seascape with some cottages from the East Coast, uh, weather-beaten cottages. And I'll just take some gesso or a drawing medium, and I'll just quickly gesture it in on that board. And I'll take the board and I'll cut it right up. It's all loose. I'll, I'll just score into it. And there, here's charcoal drawing, you know, pencil lines on there. And um, here you see some tools here where I'm scoring into the wood. And then I'll cover it with mediums to kind of seal up the wood. And then I'll paint right over it, real all fast and messy and paint flying everywhere. And then I'll start to see the paint collect in these little uh, grooves that I've scored in. You can start to see, and this is this is flat all the way through these slides. You can see this thing develop into a more of a dimensional piece. So I'll start to paint in light and shadow, and then I'll take black paint or just umber gray and grind it all in. Looks like the whole thing disappears. But the cool thing is you can start wiping away where the light would be. And again, these are all just flat, just like the screen is just flat, and you start to pull out with light and shadow angles and little by little it starts to develop these forms and then it starts to add a little more color and then more color and these things become that's remember the little just the little white line drawings and then these things become little sculptural looking cool things that in a gallery especially with like track lighting they actually look like when I when I have gallery openings people come in they always, sometimes I see their hand almost want to go up and and touch these angles but they're but they're flat so these are some of the some of the uh, other things aside from books this is, what is a good example of you feel like you can run your hand hit here go like this hit here and it's just so fun for me to to work both in full dimension for real you know and actually build things out and then work flat and try to make it look dimensional just by light and shadow here's another example of just being fast like i want to paint a big huge fish head this thing is this, the total paint is like nine feet long. And I just thought it would be cool to just paint this huge fish head. You'll see it later in the slides. I love fishing. And um, I decided after I got the head in, I said, man, I guess it would be cool to have the whole body. So I just, I started taping paper and not taping, but, but uh, adhering paper with, with mediums, painting meals and mediums. And, and sometimes I actually sew the paper right together and just burnish it in with glues and mediums. And I just kept adding paper. You can see how messy all this gets. But I, it, to me, it's not even a mess. It's just it's layers and layers of awesome paint that I can start pulling an image out of. And so here's this is this is this little studio I used to have. It's a little where you can see that. See how big it is. There's a, there's a, that's a big doorway, a big ten foot ceilings. And then the finished piece. There's my little niece that walked by to, to say, "Oh, Rachel, stop for a second. Just, I'm trying to take a picture of this fish to see how big it is." So it was like nine feet long. Here's a, another cool, cool piece out of wood that um, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Massachusetts had a show, and they, the theme was Magic Gardens. And they asked if they could show all the illustrations from my book, The Story of Frogway and Ratbone, in sequence, because it relates, when you see the book, to, uh, to uh, beautiful, magical, gardening things. And they said, if you want to do any other paintings aside from just the book, please do. So I went back into these wood things and started. These are all just big pieces of uh, like quarter inch plywood, just really quickly cut with, uti you know, with uh, utility knives and broken pieces and just nailing them and sew them together. And I'll kind of go through these just fast so you can see the development of how these things kind of just shift and just painting fast, let mistakes happen, putting all these different like textures, playing with paint to see what it would look like. Maybe I'll sand it out. I think I just re this whole top piece, repaint it back in, boom, boom, all these different changes keep happening, happening, happening. You stare a lot, you look a lot, and pretty soon it just comes to 
a finish, and there it is in the, in the uh, museum. So it just starts real loose and fast and fun. So play inspires my art and ideas a lot. What I do outside the studio totally inspires what I do inside the studio. And this I have a lot of fun with the, with the kids with this little this little group of slides here. I start with like a rectangle to show how an idea can just start happening from the simplest shapes, like a rectangle. I mean, this could be anything from a, uh, it could be a house, it could be, some kids say, a hot dog bun. Some, one, one of the children said, you could be looking from the top down and there could be little horses in here, it could be a corral, a fence. So it could be anything, so you just make a decision and you make two more lines on it and, and see how that starts to change your mind. Like, okay, it could be a rocket ship, let's say it is a house. So, oh, let's make it a dimensional house. And how do you do that is you, you um, in perspective drawing, and I don't give a lot of draw, uh, examples of perspective drawing. I love drawing perspective, make things look 3D. And so you all of a sudden have this kind of cube shape, and then you can play with the lighting. And sometimes I'll take a child and ask their name. I said, okay, Alice, this, Alice, this is your little house, and you're in this little window right here. And all the kids just get a big, the biggest kick out of it. That their, that their little friend is in this window. And Alice is yelling that the light is coming from this direction. I'm like, well, we're just trying to play with the lighting so we can see the cast shadows and where they go. But I can't sleep. So, okay, we'll change the lighting. So we'll put the lighting from this way and the cast shadows go off that way. And Alice starts yelling again, but the light's still coming in the house. So I'll tell the kids, let's play a little joke and let's change the lighting completely. And look at the magic of illustration. All of a sudden, Alice's house is floating. So she's in there in a floating house. And if she has a floating house, that means she'd have a floating tree. So just by just that little tiny rectangle, it's changing into this like story of this floating tree, this floating house. If she's got that, then she's got a floating bike too. And then maybe even her brother is floating by and he floats to school. And of course the kids just absolutely love this stuff and how, you know, how these ideas develop. So now the other thing, Real play. This is where I'm from right here. This is this is a, a aerial shot of Cape Cod. And when you land, this is what it looks like on the beaches. It's miles and miles of beach. And this is where I grew up. And I am definitely a beach bum. I grew up just loving bare feet, shorts, and that's it. Just running around these beaches. So I grew up in Cape Cod. spent my whole life there, still in there. Sliding down sand dunes and playing on waves and surfing and uh, sleeping with the seals. <laughs> I love, I tell the kids I sleep right between this big one. He's, every night he snores, it's, they believe me. So I want to show a cool video of uh, the stuff we do. This is a little underwater video I took with a little digital, digital camera. And um, this is my brother where we were catching lobsters. This relates to uh, where, you know, inspirations for paintings and everything. Check this out. Fuzzy stuff hanging down. That, those are all eggs. Tons and tons and tons of eggs. Like millions of eggs. And that's illegal to take a female since she can release those eggs any time. And that could be a lot more lobsters for us. So we let her go. And I was like, this is lobster. You take care of your little, your three million children there. And so as I was taking another picture of her, I got closer. There's her eye. She's looking right at me. Watch this. <laughs> Feisty. That's why I'm always underwater. So um, I just I love this stuff. Meanwhile, my brother's swimming off. I'm still just messing around, taking these videos. And this is a lobster that we did catch and kept. This is a male. This is a huge lobster. And um, we had an awesome party and, and just feasted on lobster. That's why we're down there diving for them. In fact, this one. You want to see how it fit in the pot? It didn't. Look at this. You know Jiffy Pop popcorn, we, where, the, where the tin foil comes, pops up? We had, to, we had to take this, put them in the pot, and stand them up and pinch tin foil about this high up with a little hole for the steam to come out. We nailed it just right, my buddy and I, and um, we had a feast. So I look at these, these claws even, and I love detail and textures. And again, this is stuff aside from even books. I just love painting and art. And I'll, a lot of these claws will have scratches and, and um, injuries and bent up little things. 
where they, they, they fight. They fight for territory, they fight over females, and it's just a cool texture. So I'll take paint and I will burnish paint in layer after layer, work it messy, you know, it's all over the place, and then block in the shape and redraw and repaint and, and start to score out some of these textures. And I'll have fun just making just, just a painting of a huge lobster claw or a big basket of clams or this was like five feet, this big, huge painting of a, of a beautiful cohort shell. So I also love fishing. I'm fishing all the time, and the kids love to see these big fish. So I always say, do you want to see a bigger one? Of course, they say, yeah, I'll go, look at this one. And this is a tuna fish, and they're like, oh my god. And this is a small tuna. Tuna get up to 1,000 pounds. This is a bluefin tuna. So of course I say, would you like to see a bigger fish? And they say, yeah. Sometimes the auditorium's got like 500 kids in it, and they're screaming to see a bigger fish. So I show them this one, and they're, oh my god, a shark. So this is a mako shark, and, and, and if you go along with the size limits and everything else, you can keep one to eat. And because I know a ton of people love to eat fish, I don't know if you've have you ever had a mako shark steak? They are delicious. It's like, it's like swordfish almost, you know, close to that. Awesome. So I fed a bunch of neighbors and everything uh, shark. So then I said, you want to see even a bigger one, you got to check out this video. This is us, my buddy and I, fishing for tuna. And um, where the tuna feed, the whales feed. They feed on the same thing. So the whales are around. This is actually good to see the whales around because it's possibly the tuna will be around. But of course, you want to stay away from the whales. But check out how cool it is. There's this fluke. So we're turning right this, turning this way. There's off in the distance the fog. There's a huge tail coming out. Watch how close this other one pops up with a big mouthful of sand eels he's feeding on. That's a big mouth of huge, big, giant growth. And he's going to get ready to press his tongue, shut his mouth, press his tongue up, and squeeze all the water from the bailey. And all the fish can't get through that bailey and have a mouthful of fish. But that's how close we're going to go. So I just love these moments of you know, doing these things. When I get to the studio, I start painting this stuff. So I do oil paintings of fish crashing through the water, and uh, pastel drawings of fish, and acrylic paintings of fish, uh, charcoal drawings of fish. What I would say, one of my favorite stories that I've never fully read <laughs> is Moby Dick. Love Moby Dick. I mean, that's I've, I've read like chapters and stuff. I need to sit and read the whole thing. But I just love just the idea of this you know, Herman Melville hanging around the docks and. There was that, did anybody read uh, uh, Essex, the, the whale ship Essex? That it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's actually a ship, a whaling ship that got rammed by a bull sperm whale and sunk. And because only like two people survived, they, they found a whaling ship that happened to, happen to pass by. The last two or three survivors were in a lifeboat, gnawing. I mean, they looked like skeletons gnawing on the bones of their, of their uh, shipmates. They're just sucking on the marrow. Literally, they, they had minutes left, seemingly, to, to live. They were saved, so they brought the story back. And Herman Melville, at Melville overheard this on the docks. And that's apparently where uh, Moby Dick's his, the idea came from. So I, I love just doing paintings. I've probably done about five paintings like this, big paintings of giant white whales crashing ships. It's just, it's just too cool. So, you know, Ahab-type drawings and paintings and just big bearded men battling the raging seas. And guys like this. Um, so I go from range from like Renaissance type drawing, you know, uh, from uh, you know like Michelangelo, Da Vinci, you know, I love Italian art and everything. But I also love you know the illustrated me and just kind of caricatures and stuff. And I mean, look at this guy. He was totally inspired by like what if there was like a, a world famous spear fisherman and you see him swimming around there. This is a funny little body. I, just, I love this character right here. Or this guy, the famous sand dollar diver. This little, like, you know, bikini on, he's mask, he's just, you know, the, the best diver in the world. So, um, all this stuff inspires gallery art, and it also inspires stories. Do you guys even guess what, the, what, these, what this is right here? It's sand, mud, you see these holes? These holes are clam holes. And the clam is in its shell with its neck that goes out to eat, and sucks right into hide. And they, that's their life. They just sit in the mud and grow and just be there and feed and they filter. So in the, down in that little hole, their neck is, so you, so you break down in there and you just basically 
grab the clam, bring them home, boil them, and eat them. So here we have what looks like, to me, villains. After so many times clamming, I finally one day was like, what if clams could do something other than just be in the mud and just, you know, be nothing except for just a quick eat? So I looked at my brother and his son like, like, like they were like villains with these little clam rakes, little like claws, you know? So, so I'm talking away. He's like, come on, the tides come in. We got an area with his almost elbow deep. And here, here's the clams. There's this little neck hanging out. And they look like they're in jail, don't they? They can't do anything. So I'm talking to my brother, I'm saying, what if you look, turned around after working so hard to get a basket of clams, and you turned around and all the shells were laying there, but there, was, there were no clams, they all had run away. And then I said, love joke with the kids, can you imagine sitting there eating a sandwich on the beach, and all of a sudden you saw 100 clams run by with no shells on? It would just be <laughs> funny. So I said, I'm gonna write a book. So I said, oh my God, you gotta kill me. So I did, I stayed on it, and th that's, that's a clam without a shell on. So I, I said, can you imagine this being our hero? And in my book, they can, and they're wiggle skins. It's called Necks Out for Adventure. And I'm going to read really quickly just a couple pages to entice and then leave you a cliffhanging moment. For as long as anyone could remember, the wiggle skins would not leave the mud. While the currents flowed back and forth over their heads, they all lived by a simple system. Necks out to eat and necks in to hide. That's how it always was, until one day when a young Wiggleskin named Edwin asked his mom a very big question. What would happen if we flowed with the current? <laughs> the other Wiggleskins laughed, but Edwin's mom held him close. Don't let them bother you, son, she answered. Stick your neck out for adventure, like you always do. But before Edwin could reply, a dark shadow fell across the Wiggleskin bed. All the Wiggleskins fell silent as the mud trembled. Then suddenly, two huge, filthy feet appeared. And worse yet, a terrible smell you'd never forget. Next in to hide, the Wiggleskins all screeched. But sadly, it was too late to hide. Soon, all the Wiggleskins Except one. Why was Edwin left behind? No one knows. Edwin's neck was pulled way in. He was dreadfully afraid. Long, lonely hours passed, but no one returned. As Edwin waited and waited, he felt the current steadily push against him, encouraging him to search for the others. I, I can't move, he told the current. I'm stuck in my shell. And that, my friends, is when Edwin thought of his mom's last words to him, next out for adventure. So Edwin gathered up every bit of courage he had. With no one around to witness this unheard of event, he pushed at both sides of his shell and, oh boy! That's where I stopped. Oh. <laughs> it gets good. He does it. He is brave. So you'll have to see that book. Here's another inspiration. I don't think I'd ever be inspired by a big, buggy, you know, city that looks like it might have not, not a, a blade of grass or anything, but it was a good inspiration. And that inspired the story of Frog Belly Ratbone. Because one day I was outside of Los Angeles on my bike, doing some fun things, it was, it was back in art school, and I saw a little tiny garden off by Descanso Gardens, it was like a botanical garden. Off to the side, everything was miniature. There was little handwriting on the little, on little um, carrot uh, labels and things, and I was like, oh, it's like a little garden. So this woman came in while I was drawing the scarecrow that the kids had built. And she said, this is a garden for, that the children of the inner city are taking care of, children that had no idea how to garden or what a seed does. And they made this scarecrow to protect this garden. This idea of these little ch children from the inner city trying to make this place beautiful was just an amazing thought to me. And uh, that, along with children's art being a huge inspiration, this is my little son's drawing, and this, he just did this on his own the other day. Um, 
he wanted to know how to spell Captain Ahab. And so here was his letters first. He's, he's just turned four. And um, so I said, C-A-P-T-I-N, and he wrote that. And then he didn't want to write Ahab. Hey, he just wanted, he said, Dad, well, what does this say? I said, well, this is Captain Ed you know? <laughs> He goes, OK. And I was good with him. And he did this drawing of this whale and this. And I love children's art. I can just pour with children's art. I love how loose it is, love how free it is. I mean, look at these little stick legs. And look at those shoes. I mean, look at the shape of the hat. How could you not love that hat on top of that? <laughs> Head. So you'll see in, in my books and things, and I, you'll see the inspiration from ch children's art. So uh, I'm going to read another um, couple of pages from this book, The Story of Frog Billy Ratbone. In a dull, gray, endless place called Cementland, and there you see the, the inspiration of the, the, the city there, there lived a very special boy. This boy had a singular wish. He wished to find a treasure. And there you see the pipes and hoses and drippy things and cement everywhere and his little patch of the boy looking for treasure. Each day the boy searched through the heaping piles of junk that collected around cement land. He found greasy toaster ovens, broken TVs, and wet, smelly socks. But no treasure. The only thing in these junk piles is Jump, cried the boy, and there he is kicking the greasy toaster oven. He was angry enough to give up, when all of a sudden, he spotted something unexpected. There he is in the bottom. It was a strange and wonderful box. Attached to the box was a wrinkled note which said, Put my wondrous riches into the earth and enjoy. The boy pried open the lock with a twisty piece of wire. The lid. Would you love to find a box like that with a note like that? Right? And, and then to lift the lid and see the light the sparkle of his color. The box was bursting with dazzling colors. I found a treasure, shouted the boy. He took one of the beautiful packages and tore it open. And that's where I'm going to leave you. <laughs> Got to see the book. These kids right here, these children, are the inspiration for my most recent book. These kids right here, you would almost think, are fearless. They do everything with me. This is on the boat. We're catching lobsters. This is Finn. He's seven. This is Sawyer. He's four. I love it. I miss him just looking at him. Look at him. Here they are. And they're my kids. Yep, yep my 22 boys. And um, they do everything with me. I get dressed up with them. I, I mean, we do all kinds of stuff. And again, you think they're fearless. They just love dressing up with box kids like Daniel Boone and Indians and, and fishing and scuba, uh, snorkeling and diving and all this stuff. Look at him. There he is with a food skin hat. There's my other son. But, however, they're not fully, totally fearless. They sometimes have a little problem staying in their own beds at night because all the things that they battle during the day start to be a little bit different when the lights go out at night. And I remembered clearly, I just remember so clearly when I was that age and some of the nights where the nightmares were happening, running into my mom and dad's bedroom, even if I could sleep on the floor next to the bed just to feel safe. And I used to think in a way, in my dreams to kind of combat this, I kind of like invented this thing where I would try to be super cool to the bad guys or the evil things or the monsters in my dreams so they would be cool to me and kind of make friends with them. That way I wouldn't get hurt. And it kind of worked for me. So I started talking to my sons like this and telling them how I used to do this, right? So all of a sudden, there's another story right underneath my nose. And this is the story coming up. The Almost Fearless Hamilton Squidlegger by Timothy Basil Aaron. So, end papers. To, get to you, Finn and Sawyer, an homage to your wondrous, marvelous, and glorious imaginations. The Almost Fearless Hamilton Squidlegger. During the hours when the sun shares its light, 
Hamilton is a daring doer and a dream come truer. Why, he's the rippingest, roaringest squid legger in the Sprintleberry Swamp. Dad! Dad! Watch Dad! Hamilton calls out. My mighty shield can block the flames of a fire breathing dragon snapper. Amazing, Hamilton. Your strength and speed are stupendous, says Dad. And my sword can, can dodge the claws of a skelly dragon. What courage you have. It takes one brave squid legger to tickle the foot of a rattlesneed. One might say Hamilton's squid legger is fearless. Well, not quite. He's almost fearless. You see, when the sun disappears behind the squintleberry trees, it won't be long before it's bedtime. Each night at bedtime, Hamilton's dad has to plead with Hamilton, please, 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 son, stay in your own mud tonight, he says. All alone, Hamilton's lasts about two minutes before he hears something. Oh, what's that? Is it the sound of a fragment snapper? Or a skelly dragon, Or a, or a brackle sneed? Hamilton springs from his mud and scrambles to his secret hideaway. <laughs> Look at the elbows in the side. <laughs> he sprawled out. <laughs> the next day when the sun snaps up from behind the scrintleberry trees, Hamilton will wake with vigor. He is fearless once again. And there you see the parents. <laughs> Exhausted again. Well, friends, this went on. Until one particular afternoon when Hamilton was sneaking, wrestling, and sword fighting. And his nose discovered the scent of something that dreams are made of. A double-decker grasshopper worm cake with snake belly frosting. Oh, it was Hamilton's absolute favorite treat. I made this especially for you, Hamilton, said his father. You can eat it all for breakfast tomorrow, under one condition. Tonight, you must stay in your own mud. Anything, anything for that delicious cake, Hamilton explained. Little note from my editor when we got to this part. She said, This is awesome. There's bribery in it. <laughs> <laughs> but when steel gray rain clouds darkened the swamp and the boom of thunder shook the scrintleberries, Hamilton had doubts. What if a lightning monster comes tonight? He asked, crawling reluctantly into his mind. Ha! scoffed his dad. What if one does? Think good thoughts is what I say. Monsters are silly, and they love to play. Have a cake fight with it. He gave Hamilton a kiss goodnight, gently patted him between the eyes, and then doused the light. Hamilton knew he would be too afraid to have a cake fight with any lightning monster. Plus, he, he wanted to eat the cake, oh, not play with it. He imagined licking the delicious frosting. And he imagined the yummy crunch of the baked grasshoppers. He was a tongue length away from a soft, juicy, soft boiled worm when SPLAT! There was a lightning monster, and his dad was right behind it, throwing a glob of cake at the monster's ear. Grasshoppers and worms splattered everywhere as the monster scraped off some snake belly frosting and pitched it right back. Off they ran, giggling and laughing, till they were out of sight. Hamilton followed the trail of frosting. When the trail ended at an old TV, Hamilton turned and twisted the knobs. Where are you, Dad? At that very moment, he heard his dad's voice, and appearing in the TV screen, pedaling a triple-seated dragon cycle, were his dad and the lightning monster. 
Nothing to be afraid of, son, is what I say. Monsters come because they want to play. Then the TV shook wildly, as though it were alive. And out from the top, bottom, and sides, a Bracklesteed's tentacles appeared and grew bigger and bigger. What's more, the TV was squirting and spraying hundreds of gallons of pink lemonade everywhere. The whole place flooded, and now it was a giant pink lemonade ocean, and a passing ship was right there when Hamilton needed it. He boarded the ship, but at the same time, the Bracklesneed wanted to board the ship, too. The ship's bow heaved in the huge pink waves, tossing Hamilton through the air and right down through a hatch into the galley, where a striped bass stood calmly at a stove, humming sea shanties and cooking pancakes. A monster is trying to sink the ship, Hamilton screamed. No worries, mate. The bass replied, I've invited it for a snack. Always be nice to a grackle steed is what I say. They make great friends and they love to play. And the fish asked Hamilton to help the grackle steed into the gallery. Hamilton bravely did as the bass had asked. Now to feed my other two friends, the fish said, flipping some pancakes up through the hatch. Upward ho you go, he shouted. Hamilton climbed up and was amazed to see that the skelly kraken was now manning the helm. The fragon snapper was on board too. Trip the balloon rigging, cried the bass, while he and the brackelsteed mounted the deck. Upward ho we go. Powered by the fragon snapper's wild breath, the ship began to rise. They sailed through the air over magnificent and breathtaking things. And this in the book you can take right here. And it's a huge gatefold that spreads out like this. A place to stop for a second and see this huge adventure. And you can pick out each one, all the friends and Hamilton, all in here. And it's just a big, dreamy landscape, seascape. You're looking up, you're looking down. The animals kind of fade in and turn into fish. The fish turn into clouds. They go back into a waterfall. Even the Brackelsteed's letting Hamilton skim his feet across the water. They're just having a ball together. But Hamilton missed his dad. He borrowed a spotting scope and looked far and wide. Following a rainbow all the way down to where its arc began, Hamilton saw something that made his eyes widen with joy. Dad, cried Hamilton, Dad, Dad! Who should be on that cloud but his beloved Dad and the lightning monster? The ship raced down the arc and everyone was thrilled to be reunited. A celebration ensued and oh my, could those squid leggers dance. The friends played and sang together until the sun began to slip down behind the horizon. Hamilton climbed back to the poop deck and gazed out. He knew he needed to tell the others before it was too late. It's bedtime, Hamilton proclaimed. All the friends cheered with joy. They hurried off to brush their teeth and wash their faces, hands, claws, and tentacles so that they could listen to Hamilton's dad read them a book before they all went to sleep in their very own cabins. That, my friends, was the moment when the almost fearless Hamilton Squidlin So that's my latest book, and I'm working hard on another book right now, I'm developing it with my editor. You know, just a little tiny hit. There's not even really a working title yet, but it's about a little duckling born in a fiddle case. 
I think he's going to save the day too, or save the family. So thank you guys. I'm so thrilled to be invited and a part of the whole Humanities Festival and everything. So thank you so, so, so much. Thank you. Thank you.